wanted to say hello. My name is Michael Duffy. I am the Executive Director of the AIDS Action Committee of Massachusetts, and together with Amnesty International and Physicians for Human Rights, as well as a number of other groups, we pulled together this panel for you tonight. If you're like me, I imagine there are a number of you who are here wondering about uh, this issue, the issue of AIDS and HIV, and what it is that you can do with regard to the epidemic. I'd leave you with two messages. One is that the issue for us here in the United States and in Massachusetts is not over, and it requires your attention and your vigilance, your resources, your time, and we're continuing to fight that fight, and that the problem internationally is as bad as it's ever been and appears not to be getting any better. Um, we had AIDS Action a few years ago, led by a number of staff who are here today, um, took the initiative to try and share what we've developed over two decades of responding to the epidemic in the country of Botswana. And what I'd like to present to you right now is a brief uh, three-minute uh, video that describes uh, that work. It hit hard in the gay community. Groups of volunteers began to organize to address this mysterious threat. In 1983, in Boston, the AIDS Action Committee was formed to respond to the growing crisis. People with AIDS were stigmatized and shunned, especially in those early days of ignorance and fear. The Buddy program was started by the AIDS Action Committee. It matched volunteers with those who were sick. The Buddies gave comfort where co-workers, friends, and even family abandoned those who had the virus. Another program, the Speakers Bureau, sent people living with the disease out to put a human face on the illness. And I'm a person living with AIDS. To reduce the stigma and to provide accurate information. Today, AIDS is recognized as a global pandemic. The continent of Africa is being decimated. Botswana, with nearly 40% of its adult population infected with HIV, has been identified by the UN as having the highest rate of infection on the planet. Through an introduction by the Harvard AIDS Institute and grants from the U.S. State Department and Bristol-Myers Squibb, the AIDS Action Committee brought its 20 years of experience to a small grassroots AIDS service organization in Botswana. The Buddy Program and the Speakers Bureau were modified to suit the local culture. So you can take as much or as little of this folded into what you're doing. When staff from AIDS Action came to Botswana in 1999, there was only one woman in the country who was public about her status. Today there are many. Working together with AIDS Action, Neo, a 27-year-old woman living with HIV, became a member of the Speakers Bureau. She has two children, one and seven years old. We try to break the stigma by showing them this does happen to anyone, even if you don't think it can happen to you. Neo has spoken about her responsibility to go out and empower those people who are still in denial about HIV. Mary, another young woman from Botswana, reached out. After her husband and other members of her family died of AIDS, Mary became a buddy. Sometimes you find there is that person there, she doesn't even know what step to take as a sick person. But since you are a buddy, you are going to be there for that person. Mary is currently working as a buddy, providing support to an HIV-positive woman who lives outside of Botswana's capital city. As in Massachusetts, the work in Botswana is about educating people to reduce the spread of AIDS and reaching out to those who have the virus. 20 years after it first opened its doors, the AIDS Action Committee is still here, still caring, still fighting.
evening. I'm John Shattuck, the CEO of the John F. Kennedy Library, and on behalf of myself uh, and Deborah Leff, the library director, I want to welcome you to the library. We are marking today International Human Rights Day, and we are honored to host this evening's forum, in which I think we will be exploring how to develop a political mobilization to combat one of the great enemies of human rights, the global scourge of AIDS. I want to thank the many, many organizations that have worked with the Kennedy Library and with each other in co-sponsoring this event. One of the purposes of this event is to bring together organizations from the field of human rights and the field of health and AIDS action to address this crisis in the way that we are doing so today. And I think uh, you will see in the panels that we had, the panel that we've assembled tonight, uh, many of the organizations have helped us provide uh, outstanding speakers here today. Because we are at the Kennedy Library, it is perhaps fitting to launch this evening's program with a political call to arms that was issued more than 40 years ago. On January 20th, 1961, a young American president took the oath of office at a time of global stress. and He put forth a challenge that I think has continued to reverberate through the decades. He said, now the trumpet sounds, now the trumpet summons us, not as a call to bear arms, the arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are but as a call to bear the long twilight struggle year in and year out, a struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease, and war itself. Can we forge against these enemies a grand and global alliance, north and south, east and west, that can assure a more fruitful life for all? Will you join? in that historic effort. Those were the words of President Kennedy. The mission of the Kennedy Library is to convene those who seek to forge this global alliance against the common enemies of humankind. And tonight, as part of our ongoing series here at the Kennedy Library, Seeking Common Ground, Civil Rights and Human Rights, we will explore the rights perspective on the struggle against AIDS. The AIDS crisis has been fueled by abuses of the most basic human rights, the right to be free from discrimination, the right to physical and mental integrity, the right to freely receive information, and the right of equal access to treatment for deadly disease. Our keynote speaker tonight has been in the forefront of the struggle to forge a human rights alliance to combat AIDS. But before introducing her, I want to say a few words about this evening's wonderful moderator, my friend Susanna Serkin, who will introduce the other men members of the panel after we hear from our keynote speaker. Susanna is the Deputy Director of Physicians for Human Rights, one of the co-sponsors here tonight. And she served previously as Director of Membership Programs for Amnesty International. Physicians for Human Rights has organized medical rights investigations in dozens of countries, including the exhumation of mass graves in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda for the International Criminal Tribunals. And from 1992 to 2001, Susanna served as PHR's representative on the coordinating committee of the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, which, as you all know, received a Nobel Prize in 1997. Our keynote speaker tonight is one of the world's great human rights leaders. From June of 1997 until September of this year, Mary Robinson served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Throughout her five years as High Commissioner, she circled the globe many times, inspiring people around the world and prodding governments to live up to the commitments of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose signing 54 years ago we celebrate here tonight. One of Mary Robinson's greatest achievements as High Commissioner, I would say, was to put the AIDS crisis squarely on the world's human rights agenda. 
And in the months since she has left office, she has devoted herself to mobilizing international support to address the crisis. From 1990 to 97, she served as the president of Ireland. During that period, her country played an increasingly prominent role on human rights. She was the first head of state to travel to Rwanda after the genocide, the first head of state to travel to Somalia during the famine of 1992, and the first head of state to visit the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. During her time as president, Mary Robinson put special emphasis on the needs of developing countries linking the history of the great Irish famine to today's crises of poverty and disease like AIDS. In many ways, Mary Robinson embodies what President Kennedy said about the Irish spirit in a speech to the Irish Parliament in 1963 when he said, it is that quality of the Irish, that remarkable combination of hope confidence and imagination that is needed more than ever today, for Ireland is clad in the cause of human liberty. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Ireland's former president, the world's champion of human rights, Mary Robinson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be back here in the Kennedy Library on this particular occasion, but it's very hard to follow the introduction by John Shattuck. How do you live up to what he has said? But I do appreciate very much his warm and supportive words. Before we focus on the theme for this evening, and I'm going to be relatively short because there is an expert panel, as you know, and I think it's so important we have a broad discussion on the issue of addressing uh, the human rights perspective on HIV AIDS. I just want to remind us that this is actually a good human rights day. Um, the 10th of December has always been an important day for me for as long as I can remember as kind of a law student and post-law student, etc. When I became High Commissioner, it was an extraordinarily important working day. The focus of attention on Human Rights Day was, was very critical. I spent my first Human Rights Day in South Africa, side by side with Nelson Mandela, then president. This was December, the 10th of December, 1997, when he launched the Plan of Action for Human Rights for South Africa. And it was such a privilege to stand beside him as he joked, as he always does, and said light things in a very serious context, and launched a slow plan of action for human rights and he said to those who were going to be carrying it out, don't be in a hurry. Take your time. Make sure everybody's consulted. Make sure everybody has an input. If you come back to me too early, I'll know you haven't done a good job. And it was this kind of light but serious uh, understanding of human rights that was so precious. So why is this for me um, a very good human rights day? First of all, because a genuine human rights person has been honored deservedly today in Oslo, President Jimmy Carter getting the Nobel Laureate for Peace. Again, if I can put it in purely personal terms, the support that I got from Jimmy Carter over my five years as High Commissioner is something that I truly welcome the opportunity to acknowledge publicly was there in so many different ways. I won't delay by going into them, but it was a human rights support in the Carter Center where we had a number of seminars, but also in the way in which he affirmed the importance of UN special rapporteurs, which few people recognize. He was an insider on human rights, and it was great to hear his speech today, which I'll come back to in the context of the subject we're discussing. And the second reason why this is a good human rights day is that a very small country that recently became a member of the United Nations has stirred up human rights today in a way that is wonderful. East Timor became the, I think it was 191st member of the United Nations. I might be wrong on the number, but anyway, in uh, September. And when I was there in August, they were committed to ratifying the core human rights instruments 
And I remember having a conversation with the Foreign Minister, um, uh, Ramos Horta, and saying, if East Timor were to ratify the International Convention on Migrant Workers and their families, that would bring it into operation. That would be the 20th ratification. What do I read this morning? East Timor has done the business. We have a new convention for migrant workers and their families, which will be hugely important for our world. And we can thank a country whose people suffer greatly who understand that at the international level, human rights is about building blocks, is about the steps that we take forward and how we do it. And I can tell you that was a very, very significant step. And it's a great joy that such a small and special country uh, made that step. And the third reason why I'm very positive about this Human Rights Day is that we are gathered together on International Human Rights Day to focus on one of the greatest problems and threats for human rights worldwide. You're going to hear a lot of expertise from the panel. And I know that in a way, statistics now are a great switch off. The more we talk in millions, the less people seem to listen. Um, it's, it's almost as if a block comes up. But the first time that I realized the scale of the problem was when I went to Strasbourg as president of Ireland to take on a short-term job as special rapporteur or general rapporteur or whatever I was for the preparatory meeting for the World Conference on Human Rights, which was going to take place in June of 93. This was early 93, maybe February, March. The Irish government was very worried about their president taking on a job as general rapporteur of a human rights think tank like that. The, so I was watched by my civil servants as much as anybody else. And I had an opportunity to listen a lot to human rights people. And for the first time, I realized that this issue of human rights that was being talked about was be becoming a huge, massive problem of human rights. And the more I talked, the more I realized I would have to put something in my report. And I did put in my report a sentence or two that said, before the end of this millennium, we may have as many as 20 million people affected with HIV AIDS. I don't think I really believed it, but they were telling me this. And my civil servants, my Irish civil servants said, President, where are you getting this from? We, we haven't got this. Um, are you sure? And I said, I think it's important to say this because I think we need to know the scale of what we're dealing with. This was in 1993. And I honestly did not understand at all. I don't think I understood either even though I did encounter it as President of Ireland. But certainly in my work for five years as High Commissioner for Human Rights, regrettably, I understood more and more. When you have countries that have more teachers dying than they can train teachers, how on earth do you achieve the millennium goal of all children having primary education by 2015? These are the ways in which you assess it. Yesterday in New York, I attended um, an event um, giving awards to countries that produced good human development reports. It was hosted by UNDP, and the overall figure being honored was the president of Brazil, uh, President uh, um, uh, Cardozo. But one of the human development reports that was honored was one that you've heard a little about in your film this evening. It was um, a human development report for Botswana. And the Minister of Health of Botswana was there to receive the prize. And as I listened to her, I thought it's only people living day and night with the problem who really, in fact, are entitled to speak truly to an audience like this about the dimensions of the problem. She spoke with such dignity, with such authority, with such compassion about the suffering that her country and her people and she as Minister for Health were coping with. And she gave us a chink of light. She said, for the first time, the figures of infections have started to fall in Botswana. And that is because of an extraordinarily um, committed involvement of the government and civil society. Governments alone have a very um, slim role to play, cannot do it. It involves everyone. And that's what she said. And when she accepted the award, she did it very gracefully 
on behalf of all of the people that she captured so well who were combating the scourge of AIDS in her country that is so visible, that is such a tangible problem in her country. What do we want to focus on this evening? We want to focus on the human rights issues in relation to HIV AIDS. And when I was here last January, John Shattuck referred to a speech that was made by President Kennedy to the General Assembly of the United Nations about 30 years ago, and it was all about discrimination. I just want to quote again from the first paragraph of what he uh, referred to as he addressed the General Assembly. He said, the members of this organization are committed by the Charter to promote and respect human rights. Those rights are not respected when a Buddhist priest is driven from his pagoda, when a synagogue is shut down, when a Protestant church cannot open a mission, when a cardinal is forced into hiding, or when a crowded church service is bombed. The United States of America is opposed to discrimination and persecution on grounds of race and religion anywhere in the world, including our own nation. We are working to right the wrongs of our own country. And then he went on to describe the measures that we're taking to counter discrimination. Now, why do I recall that speech in our context of combating HIV AIDS? Because essentially, one of the worst problems that doesn't get enough attention is the problem of stigma and discrimination and denial and violations of human rights. We hear a lot about, and I'm glad about this, um, the need for more medical care, health care, funding, etc. And that's all very important. We don't hear enough about this area. And I was very glad to work very closely about this time last year um, with my friend Peter Piot of UNAIDS, a great human rights advocate within the UN system, where we were preparing the way for a year-long campaign at the official level on combating stigma and discrimination. In other words, on the human rights dimensions of HIV AIDS. And I'll leave others to talk about the scale of the problem that we're talking about. But even in the face of these stark numbers, many governments have been unwilling to recognize the realities in their own countries. Fortunately, I think in most countries, this is beginning to change. More and more governments, and particularly the civil society, the people they represent, know that practical steps must be taken urgently. Failure to take effective action can be devastating. For example, I've paid seven visits to China as High Commissioner. I'm deeply concerned about the situation in China, where some two million people may have HIV AIDS, HIV, be HIV positive. It's not, the figures are hard to um, calculate particularly, but that's up from 10,000 only 10 years ago, 10,000 to 2 million in that short span of time. And for that reason, UN officials have estimated that this could reach somewhere between 10 and 20 million by 2010. So in eight more years, we could be up to 20 million, just in one country alone. And the official denial and cover-up of the AIDS crisis is contributing to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of peasants, of poor people, of those who just don't have any access to knowledge or medical help. Fortunately, the official attitude has changed in recent months, and in particular um, for um, AIDS Day this year. Uh, there were very strong statements made, but it will take much more than that. One organization which is addressing the problem throughout China is the All China Federation for Women. They're doing very good work in various provinces. They're urging women to protect themselves, and they have 60 million members, which means they can be relatively effective throughout China. But it's great to see a leadership being given by women because of the stark um, urgency um, of the situation. And it's only through better cooperation between governments and civil society that the, uh, the, the appropriate steps will be taken to relieve the burden of HIV AIDS. Improving health care and better access to treatments, more vigorous preventive efforts, more effective support for those who are most vulnerable, particularly children orphaned by AIDS, of whom there are some 14 million currently in our world, and that number, unfortunately, is going to rise dramatically. These are all critical components of a comprehensive strategy. So we must face the fact that while progress has been made in some countries in slowing the rate of new infections, 
and providing treatment for those suffering from the disease, many others are still fighting a losing battle. And so the question we have to ask tonight, and the panel will be addressing, is why have we not made more progress if we know what steps need to be taken to roll back the tide? I'm convinced that part of the answer lies in understanding the links between violations of internationally agreed human rights and the spread of AIDS. Consider, for example, the fact that in most countries with high HIV prevalence, violations of women's rights are widespread. Most lack the capacity to access adequate human health care or to act on prevention information. They're discriminated against, often subjected to sexual violence, and the most vulnerable women and children are forced, forced to engage in so-called survival sex, simply to afford to eat. And that is a very real problem, and it is quite prevalent, and it is very chilling when that's what a young girl tells you, that she was forced to do this because her family forced her, because this was the situation in which she found herself. Other forms of discrimination, new and old, also contribute to the spread of AIDS. In developing and developed countries alike, people living with or even suspected of having HIV are denied basic rights. They're dismissed from jobs, which they're perfectly fit to perform. They're blocked from access to health services. You have to see this in a human context to know how devastating it is. I just recall one context about in October of last year, I was in Buenos Aires for a seminar of our office, and I was asked to meet a group of gays, lesbians, and transvestites. And I sat with them in a room. Every one of them was HIV positive. Every single one of them, as we went around the table, was telling me horrific stories of personal discrimination, violence, denial of hospital care, denial of um, just the most basic um, possibilities of coping once they were very sick. Um, it was a, a, something that I remember very well, and I kind of contrasted it with what I had seen in Brazil not so long before, where I'd gone to, um, in Rio de Janeiro, um, a help hotline, which was in the police headquarters in Rio de Janeiro, in a government office, in other words, but run by NGOs. So the voice at the end of the phone was an NGO voice, but the support was there from the official quarters. Just a completely different approach. And we talked about the possibility of trying to introduce this in um, Argentina. So there are possibilities of good practices. There are things um, that can be done. But the fear of being discriminated against leads many to remain silent about their condition, or worse still, deters them from finding out even whether they are infected. They're afraid to find out, afraid to ask, afraid to... Um, be tested. And as many have said before, in the fight against AIDS, silence is death. Poverty fuels the disease. Poverty increases people's susceptibility to contracting HIV AIDS. Malnutrition increases their vulnerability. Children deprived of schooling, including those orphaned by, AID, by AIDS who must work to survive, miss the AIDS education that comes with primary education in many countries. And the literacy, or their own illiteracy, may render prevention messages incomprehensible. So the poor are also deprived of the opportunity to escape poverty through decent work. They often cannot afford medicines or proper health facilities where they can be assured their health workers will use sterile injection equipment. So how can the human rights approach help? Human rights provide a legal and ethical framework for addressing the social and development impact of HIV AIDS, as well as introducing accountability under international law for the actions or very often the inactions of governments. And I do commend to you the human rights guidelines on HIV AIDS, which my former office and UN AIDS worked on together um, in um, 19, doesn't matter, but they were revised recently and the reason they were revised was because there has been progress in the health area, and this had to be reflected in the human rights guidelines. Progress in the Doha Declaration, in court cases that meant more access to AIDS. And we had a wonderful seminar, which I recall very vividly, um, in uh, my former office in July of this year, 
chaired by Judge Michael Kirby of Australia, that brought together AIDS experts to revise, in a rather positive way, the Human Rights Guidelines, uh, Guideline 6, um, for states and NGOs and civil society in different countries. So the guidelines, I believe, are very um, up-to-date in their approach. And there are increasing examples of how human rights approaches, including targeted awareness-raising initiatives, legislative reform, and human rights activism, are helping tax tackle AIDS-related stigma and discrimination in countries around the world. Maybe I could give you just a few examples that come to mind because they often bring the point home. I was in Cambodia recently where I was addressing the parliament on the problem of trafficking in women and, and girls. I sat with young girls between 9 and 13 who had been rescued from being forced into prostitution. Every one of them was HIV positive. I was sitting on the floor with a group of young girls aged 9 to 13 and saying to myself, in five years, by and large, they'll all be dead. I found that a very difficult thing to even cope with. Um, and they didn't know that I'd had this whisper in my ear. Um, I just knew, looking at their faces, looking at them make flowers and do other kind of therapeutic work, that that was, not only had they had a brutal experience of life, but they were going to die within about five or six years under predictable circumstances. And yet, in Cambodia, legislation was passed recently which prohibits discrimination against people living with HIV AIDS and which calls for special education about the disease for young girls and women. So the country is aware of the problem and seeking to address it. In India, local NGOs have successfully defended workers who've lost their jobs due to their HIV status. HIV patient-friendly hospitals have been established, which is absolutely vital because when I was in Delhi about this time last year, I visited a small center run by a small NGO for those who were refused hospital treatment, and they were both elderly and young orphans. They would not be treated in the regular hospital, so the need to combat this kind of stigma is very real. In South Africa, courts have made landmark decisions on unfair dismissal of HIV-positive workers and um, uh, discrimination against HIV-positive people in prisons and access to HIV-related treatment and medication. Court cases are a very good uh, way of establishing a base in certain areas, and I must say I pay tribute uh, to, to judges who interest themselves in these issues. Sticking to my determination to try to be short, because I know there is a great expertise to follow, can I come back to President Jimmy Carter? Um, it's his day today in a way, and he didn't forget to mention the issue um, that we're addressing. And I just want to give you the context in which he addressed it, and I quote directly from his speech. He says, um, he, he actually in the context said, I was asked some time ago at a previous meeting in Oslo, what was the greatest problem? And then I now quote him. I decided that the most serious and universal problem is the growing chasm between the richest and poorest people on earth. The results of this disparity are root causes of most of the world's unresolved problems, including starvation, illiteracy, environmental degradation, violent conflict, and unnecessary, unnecessary illnesses that range from Guinea worm to HIV AIDS. So he chose to end a very potent sentence with what he knows must resonate throughout the world. He chose his moment to remind us. So as a global community, we'll have to address the glaring inequalities between and within our societies, between rich and poor, urban and rural, men and women. That means, I believe, rethinking our individual and shared responsibilities. It's time to revisit the wisdom of Article 29, Paragraph 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says in a very interesting way, and just listen to this because it's not something you hear every day. Everyone has duties to community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. Now, if we were writing today, we'd say his or her personality. I mean, there's a certain, this was 1948. We'll forgive them that little um, slight gender uh, thing. But I'll read it again. Everyone has duties to community in which alone the free and full development of his or her personality is possible. So it's to be full people. That's why we do it. But also, interestingly, in 1948, duties to community 
meant local community and probably radiated up to the national. Who is community now in our globalized world? If we owe duties to community, who is that community? I think that that's perhaps the most relevant thing uh, for our discussion this evening. Certainly in the project which I'm now heading, which has a very awesome title of the Ethical Globalization Initiative, or I try to soften it by saying that it's eggy to its friends, but in the Ethical Globalization Initiative, we will take our responsibility. This problem, which is the greatest human rights problem facing us in our world today, will be part of our work. We will work on access to drugs, on making known the discriminations, on trying to address these issues, because that's really what it's about this evening. What is the responsibility each of us can take, and how are we going to do it? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Mary Robinson. We are uh, hearing this charge, and we're going to move right on to uh, this panel and hopefully very soon a conversation with all of you so that we can talk about this responsibility. Um, before I introduce the panel, I just want to follow on uh, what Mary Robinson has said regarding the intent of this remarkable document whose adoption at the U United Nations General Assembly we are observing and, yes, celebrating today. Uh, one of its key drafters was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she added uh, many points about the role of community and the responsibility of citizens. When it was adopted in one of her speeches, she said, the destiny of human rights is in the hands of all our citizens, in all our communities. And she said, we must keep our minds open and be prepared to meet new needs and new circumstances as they arise. And this is rather prophetic when we think today about the challenge of global HIV AIDS. She could not have possibly foreseen the challenges presented by the global ec epidemic of HIV AIDS that we're discussing. Uh, her deep belief that was picked up by human rights groups the world over is that the business of promoting and protecting human rights cannot be left to governments alone. She envisioned a global citizens' movement working in places close to home and far away to defend all the rights enumerated in this document, and she believed that every single person had to do his or her, and she did try to get in a few hers, which she did, but not all of them, into the document, uh, to make this, this document more than just words on paper. Uh, and this epidemic that we have before us now and that those of us who are working actively in the human rights movement have decided to focus on as our core activity uh, this year and probably well into the future, sad to say, has challenged us like no other. And we need to call on the resources of many, many individuals and organizations, all of us in this room, in order to respond. We have here today, next to me on either side, the exemplification of this vision of activism. Each of our speakers tonight on the panel has a powerful track record of combating AIDS and HIV AIDS and defending the rights of those affected with it. We are today more aware than ever that the whole world is our neighborhood, as Mary Robinson said, and the people here tonight live with this recognition every day. Before I introduce them, I want to recognize publicly this a uh, very interesting and important coalition of groups that brought uh, our speakers here today, along with our uh, hosts, who I want to thank, the JFK Library and John Shattuck. Uh, and I would like to actually call on each group and have you and anyone that's associated with your group please stand so that you can see who's in the room and what kind of a coalition we are forming to go out of here tonight to continue working on this. The AIDS Action Committee of Massachusetts. Where are you? <laughs> Keep standing. Amnesty International and Josh Rubenstein, who's been very active in organizing, and his colleagues. Yeah. 
the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, the JFK School at Harvard, Francois Xavier Benyou Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health, the Harvard University Committee on Human Rights, Jackie Bava and her friends, Multicultural AIDS Coalition, I know there were people very organized in, in the planning, uh, Partners in Health, who we'll hear from, Paul Farmer, but there are others of you out here. My own organization, which has also founded the Health Action AIDS Campaign with Partners in Health, Physicians for Human Rights. All right. <laughs> and Student Global AIDS Campaign, Adam Taylor and his colleagues. And I hope that all of you will join us uh, before you leave tonight and make a commitment to take action. I'm sure you will want to do it once you hear uh, more. Uh, if you haven't yet been co convinced by Mary Robinson, which I certainly have, uh, having heard her many times, um, we're going to add to everything she has said with the on-the-ground work by the people who are doing the clinical work, the defense of the um, uh, people who are uh, dealing with HIV AIDS in their communities and in their person. Eric Sawyer is a founder and active member of ACT UP New York uh, and a co-founder of Housing Works, the nation's largest provider of housing health and advocacy services to people living with HIV AIDS. For years, Eric has been a leading activist on the global stage as well, helping to form UN AIDS, organizing numerous international AIDS conferences, and most recently, helping to launch the Health Gap Coalition, which has been campaigning for access to HIV medications for poor people in the developing world. In the film that we saw early this afternoon, for those of you who are here, he was referred to as a famous activist, and we're delighted to have you with us. We have Nick to uh, Eric George Muanguzi, who I've had the pleasure to spend the last few days with as our guest. He's a lawyer and director of the Health Rights Action Group in Uganda. He's working to defend the rights of people living with AIDS and for access to treatment in his country and in other African countries. He also chairs the UN Association of Uganda and has been a pivotal leader in the Ugandan student movement. This is his first trip to the United States and thus to Boston, and we are delighted to have him joining us tonight. Welcome. <laughs> Mary Robinson will be joining us in the question and answer afterwards, and um, we all know what her remarkable leadership has been in putting AIDS on the map as a key human rights issue. Sandra Thurman, to my right, was appointed by President Clinton as director of the Office of National AIDS Policy at the White House in 1997. For over a decade, she's been a leader and advocate for people with AIDS at local, state, and federal levels. She is now the president and CEO of the International AIDS Trust, mobilizing leadership and resources needed to address global AIDS. She's also in the film, and I know that uh, those of us who were in the room this afternoon, it was the third time I'd seen the film, uh, there wasn't a dry eye uh, in the room hearing your stories, the remarkable stories. And last but not least, on my far right, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Paul Farmer is a medical anthropologist, one of my heroes, working at Physicians for Human Rights with Partners in Health. He's a, an infectious disease physician. He's associated with Harvard Medical School and is the co-founder of Partners in Health. Paul has pioneered novel treatment using community-based medicine in resource-poor settings with uh, extraordinary projects right here in Boston, in Haiti, in Peru, and elsewhere. Paul has helped transform the debate about resources and has given hope to the most skeptical of observers of this problem. And we look forward to hearing uh, all of our speakers who are going to speak uh, fairly briefly so that we can really engage with all of you. And so without any further ado, uh, Eric.
Thank you. I, I want to make one brief note. One of the things you mentioned in, in the introduction was that I helped uh, form UNAIDS. I, I actually didn't help form UNAIDS, although I'd been on a number of uh, the work group and planning strategy sessions uh, for that body, including the session that drafted the HIV AIDS human rights recommendation for the High Commissioner's Office, which I think was in 1995. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> But I wanted to, um, to thank the organizers for organizing this terrific uh, uh, conference today. And I also want to thank all of you for coming here today because as someone who's been living with symptoms of HIV uh, for more than two decades, dating back to 1981, uh, it's an issue that is life and death uh, to me and to uh, my brothers and sisters living with AIDS around the world. And I think it's extremely fitting that we are focusing um, on AIDS today, on, on International Human Rights Day, because as, as Mary said, it's both the biggest health crisis facing the world today, and it's also one of the biggest human rights crises facing the, the world today. Um, I, like many uh, people who were first hit with AIDS in the early days of, of the AIDS ep epidemic, uh, lived through much of the stigma and discrimination that that Mary touched on. Um, I was forced onto long-term disability. I was denied uh, health and uh, access to health care, including uh, uh, surgery that I needed uh, because of my HIV status. Um, I had to uh, endure a number of uh, pretty horrendous, uh, demeaning situations in the early days of the AIDS epidemic because the, the first person I really knew who had AIDS was my boyfriend who came down with horribly disfiguring Kaposi sarcoma uh, in the early 1980s. And he went from uh, an ex-MIT uh, tennis player uh, who looked like a California surfer, weighed almost 200 pounds, over six foot two, uh, to literally being a bag of bones who was skeletal and covered with horribly disfiguring lesions. Uh, in, in giving him massages, I could literally touch my thumb to my finger on every part of his arm except for his elbow. And the discrimination that he faced um, was really unsettling. He went from being a very privileged mergers and acquisition lawyer on Wall Street, earning a huge salary, to someone who was spit upon in subway cars and, and thrown out of restaurants, and to, to someone who was completely independent, who literally I had to carry around our apartment and diaper. And the degree of stigma and discrimination we faced uh, here uh, was because of um, the lack of legal protections. We had no laws that protected us from discrimination in housing and, and employment and uh, in, in persecution. Uh, there were a number of people who, who, who faced far more horrendous things than we did, people whose houses were firebombed, such as the Ricky Ray family in, 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 uh, in Florida. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of you have uh, you know, heard a lot of those stories, but what all of us with AIDS face in the early days of the epidemic, everyone with AIDS is currently facing in the developing world. And it's not only that they lack their human right to help, which is one of the articles in, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everyone is guaranteed a human right to access to, to health and health care, uh, but because they face these kind of discriminations day after day. And a couple of, of incidents that me as an AIDS activist were uh, most um, offended by uh, happened recently. Uh, there, there was a case in, in, in Africa uh, around the time of the Durban Conference when one of the few women was brave enough in a rural area, a rural township in South Africa, came out as being HIV positive and began doing AIDS education prevention work and doing support work for women living with AIDS in her villages, uh, only to be thanked by being beaten to death by her village. And uh, it's for all of these reasons that um, AIDS is a huge human rights issue that all of you need to be involved in. Uh, through organizations like ACT UP and Housing Works and any number of other organizations, people with AIDS have been able to fight for and obtain um, a number of services uh, in this country that have allowed 
people like myself with privileged access to health care to thrive after early uh, years of uh, many health complications and discrimination. And uh, I mentioned a, you know, a, a few of them, but uh, there are a lot of people in this room who are instrumental in fighting for things like the Ryan White Care Act that provides federal funding for care and support. There are uh, laws passed. Uh, there's something called the HOPWA Act. It's the Housing Opportunities with, for People with AIDS, uh, a federal piece of legislation that provides federal support for housing and housing-related services for people with AIDS. Uh, there has been bills passed to provide early access to Medicaid and food stamps and income support through welfare that provide people with AIDS an opportunity to, you know, live uh, relatively healthy lives uh, in this country. And it's developed, uh, unfortunately, the, those successes have developed a mis- uh, conception that the AIDS epidemic is over and uh, that, you know, AIDS is something that people don't need to be aware of, uh, of or don't really need to care about because there's a new cocktail that's a cure for AIDS, it's not a cure for AIDS. Uh, and um, unfortunately, because of the success of some of these programs and the AIDS cocktail, um, a lot of people are uh, turning away from practices like safe sex, um, a lot of people are engaging in risky behavior. We see increases in the number of infections here in this country, especially amongst minority communities uh, and amongst the poor, and it's always the poor who are most vulnerable to and uh, most heavily impacted by human rights problems and health problems such as AIDS. And um, I, I, I know you're all in this room uh, because you're key because you care, um, you're, you're all in this room because you're part of the choir, and I don't want to, you know, beat you over the head. Uh, but there, there is a difference between being informed and caring and taking action. And what is needed at this point in the epidemic is an all-out war against AIDS. And some of us were recently uh, arrested in Washington the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, having a demonstration demanding money for AIDS and not for war because AIDS funding is being cut uh, or, or AIDS programs are being flat funded by the current administration in Washington. And uh, the Secretary General has courageously called for the creation of a global fund to raise up to $10 billion to combat the biggest killers in the world, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And it's uh, basically being uh, ignored by leaders in the developed country and donor countries uh, who have the resources to fund that $10 billion fund. And our own government has only pledged if, uh, $500 million to that fund, $250 million this year and $250 million next year. By the traditional UN funding formula, the United States government should be contributing somewhere in the neighborhood of $2.5 billion and $3 billion to that fund. And that's why we were getting arrested uh, in front of the White House. But um, I want you all to uh, think about what action can you take to become an AIDS activist. And, and those of you who work in an AIDS organization or a human rights organization already have strategies and, and your own action plans. But those of you who don't or or perhaps even uh, your caring and friends and family members uh, can also take action. Uh, everyone can write a check to an AIDS organization to uh, provide care and support. Uh, Mary talked a little about, bit about the number of, of orphans that are uh, currently in the 10 to 15 million uh, as we sit here today, but in the next decade we'll probably reach 40 million orphans uh, without parents to pay for their schooling, which will make them extremely vulnerable, uh, force them often to live on the streets, and uh, will probably ensure that they themselves will engage in behaviors that will make them uh, susceptible to HIV infection and certain death, given that 99% of people on this planet who have AIDS lack access to affordable medications. Um, all of you could also write a check or do volunteer work to, uh, for a number of organizations such as Partners in Health that are trying very hard to provide affordable and state-of-the-art treatment, medical care, to people with living, who are living with AIDS in the developing world. 
and all of you could pick up a phone, uh, write a fax, uh, send an email to a governmental official and demand that your government, uh, as your agent, as your leaders, uh, pay attention to the AIDS crisis, care about the AIDS crisis, and turn around the situation where a nation like our own, the richest country in the history of the world, has turned its back on AIDS and is refusing to, to do its fair share in funding the most important fight, uh, the most important war that we face uh, as we enter the next century, and that's the fight against AIDS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, George Mwanguzi. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers of this event for inviting me here. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, my pioneer trip to the U.S. is not for a holiday, but to address a very important issue that touches uh, the bottom of my heart. I want to thank uh, Madame Robinson for a very wonderful expose about uh, why we need to address HIV AIDS as human rights. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, practical steps that we can take uh, to address the HIV AIDS scourge. As I pointed out earlier, for those who are here, <clears throat> that HIV AIDS is manageable as a disease because we have got drugs that have been scientifically proved to work. And that is why me and Eric can continue to work normally like any other person. And this is very important, that we give a living testimony about what is happening and the reality. But I want to give you also briefly uh, a statistical background about the gravity of the war that we face. Currently, the estimate is about 40 million or slightly more people in the world who have HIV AIDS. And of these 40 million, you have more than 70%, actually about 71% of these infections in sub-Saharan Africa. That is Africa, south of the Sahara, including, of course, a few countries in the Sahel region. Now, that is huge because we are talking about 38 million or they are about of the 40 or 41, 42 million people in the world. And what is saddening is that of all of these people, less than 1% can access the life-prolonging drugs, the ARVs. That means you have probably less than 3 million of these who can access these drugs. And in a period maybe of between three to six years, all these people will be dead without the intervention of treatment. Now that is a great indictment on us who can do something, but more so on the international community in the form of states that are endowed with the capacity, but also who have the legal obligation to tackle this kind of epidemic. It's important that we look at HIV AIDS from a human rights perspective because it has been acknowledged that HIV AIDS is an epidemic of pandemic proportions. This means that it ceases to be an individual problem or an individual state problem and it becomes a responsibility of the community, the civilized world. This brings me to the question, why is it that for the past 20 years, the world has literally looked on when millions of people are dying and there has not been, you know, serious, deliberate steps taken to avert this situation? I'll give you a simple illustration. The events of the uh, attacks in New York, uh, September 11th, there was 
a swift and effective response against terror. The U.S. mobilized a global coalition and the Taliban regime was quickly overthrown. And Osama bin Laden and his colleagues thrown out of, of Afghanistan. After that, we saw a calculated and a consistent campaign by the U.S. and its partners to have legislation and policies in all the countries of the world proscribing and at the same time stopping terrorism as well as blacklisting terror organizations all over the world. And today, the government of the United States has moved the UN, albeit under pressure, that Saddam must disarm because he has weapons of mass destruction. Now, that, that's not yet uh, approved. But the point is, even where you have not yet ascertained and you have not had millions of people dying, you have swift, deliberate action being taken. Yet where you have millions of people dying over a long period of time, you have inaction, you have uncertainty, you have debate whether Africans can take uh, drugs properly, you know, whether if you give money uh, to the regimes that are corrupt, they can apply it properly, and whether we should not concentrate more on campaigns for prevention other than treatment. Now, when you compare the approach, it definitely uh, paints a very, very, very bad picture. And this calls for a new approach, a total departure that the civilized world shall not succumb to petty disagreements and narrow interests when we have millions of people dying day in, day out. The call, therefore, is today you who are here, individual and organizations, must carry forward today's resolve, and we should resolve that we have to impress it upon those who make the important decisions. Our governments, the international community, as well as all those individuals who care that we must address HIV AIDS as a global crisis, as an epidemic, and that we need to commit all what we can, both financial, material, and human resources. We cannot afford to leave the situation to degenerate further. This is because it has been indicated that for every year, the increase in the number of infections is about 5 million. At the end of 2001, we had about 36 million people. At the end of 2002, we have over 40 million. And you heard what Madame Robinson said. China is a bomb ready to explode. How far shall we go? And when shall we act? People continue to die. We cannot afford it to wait. We must act now. We must take our responsibility. And I want to call upon you and to thank you that you came today. We live here today with a resolve to take this struggle forward. And I'm sure if we are determined, we shall achieve. I thank you.
Thank you very much, George. I think um, this will be a very important follow to the powerful exhortation, uh, George uh, Sandra, who's been working here on the U.S. side and elsewhere to talk about the response and its challenges and its difficulties. And its challenges and its difficulties. Thank you. <laughs> um, since um, George and Eric have given most of my remarks already, um, I will abbreviate them so we can have more time for questions and answers. But there are several points that I want to make, um, both in response to what they have said and in addition um, to what they've said. And the first point, I think, is that in the analysis of all the successful programs um, that we examined during my tenure, four-year tenure at the White House, there were two components that we found in every single successful program around the world. Those were leadership from the very top, from the executive level down to the community level, and a constant influx of resources. Now, one would not think that's rocket science. It's really not. Um, but when people come to you and say, all right, how do you know these programs are successful? What are the components uh, that make a program successful? Um, we went back and got some of our good friends and analyzed those programs, and there were two very simple things, leadership um, and resources. And when we looked at leadership and resources, we realized that there weren't really good mechanisms to develop leadership and to advocate for resources uh, like the ones that we had enjoyed here in the United States on the domestic side that were led um, by um, people in, um, at AIDS Action and, and uh, the Action Council and, and other groups in the United States. It's one of the reasons that we decided at that point in time with Nelson Mandela and Bill Clinton to develop something called the International AIDS Trust, uh, which focuses solely on the development of leadership and resources in the fight against AIDS. It's important because when you look at how policy is made and how we affect change in governments all around the world, in Uganda, in the United States, in the former Soviet Union, in China, and elsewhere, um, there are some key people that have to be engaged if you're going to make progress in a hurry, and particularly if you're behind by two decades in the response that you need to have. The first, obviously, is um, leadership from heads of state engaging the executive level, heads of state and heads of government in the fight against AIDS. The other, and probably most important and often forgotten, is parliamentarians. While it's important to have the support of your head of government or head of state, the folks who actually make the policies and move the money around, and generally speaking, are members of parliament. Um, the third were first ladies, one that's often left out. Um, and first ladies can have an enormous, or first spouses, we really need to, it's not just first ladies, but we're working on, in, in this particular program in Africa at the moment, we don't want to be completely sexist, but, you know, soon we hope to have a woman as a head of state in Africa, not just quite yet, um, but looking at first ladies and the, and the influence that they can have in focusing uh, their countries um, on particular issues when their husbands might have sort of be otherwise engaged or have other issues on their plate. Um, and the other is women in powerful positions. And when we look at the new data that was released uh, on World AIDS Day, the disproportionate impact of the epidemic on women and children, it becomes increasingly important why we have to have more women in leadership positions engaged in the epidemic um, and why we have to put HIV and AIDS um, in a different position in the traditional uh, women's movement. Um, HIV hasn't quite reached the level on the agenda that it, that's um, commensurate with the impact um, of the epidemic on women today. And so the leadership piece becomes incredibly important. The second is mobilizing the resources. Eric talked about the fact that the Secretary General of the United Nations has called for $10 billion a year to mount an effective campaign. Quite frankly, we all know that that's a conservative estimate, but when you're trying to move donors, uh, from $2.5 billion a year, which is where we are currently, to $10 billion a year um, annually, it's much easier to tell them they only have to go to 10 um, instead of telling them they're going to have to go to 20, uh, at which point they'll just quit and throw up their hands and say, I, thank you very much, I don't think so. Um, so it's important to, to sort of recognize that we have to s establish benchmarks on this road that we call AIDS to make sure that we have the resources necessary to combat the disease. Interestingly enough, in, in Washington and in this country, AIDS has always been um, a bipartisan, strongly bipartisan effort. The fight against AIDS has been a strongly bipartisan effort. 
It's a very interesting study in democracy, in fact, and that's where the people lead, the leaders will follow. And when people rag on some of our colleagues uh, in, in leadership and some of the heads of state in other parts of the world about their lack of response, I always laugh and say, you know, we really have to give them the example of the United States, where we were seven years into this epidemic before an American president ever stood up and said the word AIDS in public. So, you know, we, we aren't in a position to cast very many stones. And in the interim, it was the community um, largely around this country that mobilized to care for people living with AIDS in their communities and to uh, care for people living with AIDS in those communities. Uh, and then the Congress fortunately engaged long before our executive branch ever did. So if you can't get leadership from the top, you can work it another way. Um, as my grandmother would say in an old Southern saying, and you probably can tell this little accent, I probably wasn't raised in Boston, um, that there's more ways than to, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as we used to say in the South. And uh, that probably means nothing to any of y'all. You're going, oh my God, what does that mean? Anyway, it means there's one more, one, more than one way to approach a problem. And so certainly, uh, we've shown that in, in the United States. So what can Americans do um, about all of this? I think one of the lessons that was learned uh, after September 11th uh, by all of us in this country is that suffering abroad is related not indirectly but directly to our safety and security at home. It was a painful lesson but an important one. And Americans are looking uh, for new ways um, for the U.S. to engage with people living uh, in the broader universe. That may not be true for all Americans. I don't think bombing them is necessarily the way that we want to engage with them. Um, but others are looking at more productive and constructive ways um, to engage in a broader uh, uni universe. Uh, we can build coalitions to fight HIV and AIDS just like we can build coalitions to fight Iraq. It's doable um, and we're in a position where I think we need to show leadership. The other thing is that it takes all sectors um, engaged in the fight against AIDS to move us forward. That we all understand beyond any doubt at this point in time that AIDS is not just a health issue. Um, that this is an issue that crosses all lines, uh, crosses all borders, it crosses all disciplines, um, and that it takes all of us to be involved. And as Eric has said, um, individuals can educate themselves. There are a million ways for people to get um, involved. Speak out, call your congressman, educate yourselves, have those conversations with your children and your family. Um, get involved with the organizations in your community that are actually doing work um, overseas. There are a number of organizations, including those in Boston, that at one time only did domestic work, who are now engaged in sharing the lessons learned with people overseas. Very easy to get involved um, with, with those folks, and I think it's really, really important to do that. Um, I'll just close by, I was going to talk a lot about legislation. We can talk about that perhaps in our discussion. Um, but. I think there are a couple of things that are important for us to note at this point in the epidemic. Over the past three or four years, we've gained a lot of momentum. A lot of attention has been paid to the impact that this epidemic is having all over the world. There's not a time or a week, hardly, that goes by where you don't pick up the Globe or the New York Times or the Washington Post and find some uh, article about HIV and AIDS on the front page or somewhere in the front section. But our momentum um, is slowing um, in the face of tax cuts and war and, you know, a difficult economy. It's going to be incredibly difficult to keep this issue on the front burner where it belongs. And that's why public action, action of academic institutions, actions of individuals, actions of organizations uh, becomes so incredibly important for those of us who are tasked with trying to keep people's focus on the importance of providing education and care and treatment to people living uh, with AIDS around the world. I'll just close by a couple of things. Um, one is that we are at a really critical juncture in this epidemic. 20 years into this epidemic, two long decades, we're just at the beginning of an epidemic. That's very hard for people to get their heads around. But I'm sure you've talked about this or, you know, in your discussions um, leading up to today, that 
in the best of circumstances, assuming we had a vaccine and a cure today, it would be 40 years or 60 years before we could stop this epidemic in its tracks. And I use polio as, and as an example most often. For more than 40 years, we've had an effective, safe and effective and cheap, easy to deliver vaccine for polio. We have still not been able to eradicate polio um, from the face of the earth. Even though we've had that vaccine for 40 years, we're still spending about half a billion dollars a year immunizing our children in this country alone um, against polio, and we'll have to until polio is eradicated. So under the best of circumstances, we've got a long way to go. We're just at the beginning. We can change the course of history. It is true that we have 42 million people infected. It is true that we've lost nearly 30 million people in this fight. But the fact of the matter is we can still change the course of history in this epidemic, and we know how to do it, assuming we only do what we know how to do today. Um, and caring for people living with AIDS and educating people, we can save 30 million lives. That's just doing what we know how to do today. So there's a lot of hope. You know, the good news is we know what to do. The bad news is we don't have enough will and money to do it. Um, but it's a moment in history, uh, like many others, where people have the opportunity to come together and change the course of history. And that's why I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, and, and being supportive and learning and educating yourself and others um, about the importance of the work that all of us have to do together. Thank you. Well, last person on the panel before we open up for a conversation is a person who is actually and has already changed the course of history. Mm -hmm in quite a number of places, and he's going to show you how, what that looks like, I believe. Thank you, Susanna. Of course, I, <clears throat> I work with a lot of people, and I'd like to thank tonight uh, the people from JFK, uh, John, Deborah, Tom, Holland. I won't thank my colleagues in the human rights community, nor will I thank my colleagues in the medical community, uh, nor will I thank my comrades uh, in the activist community, because we've been working together uh, a long time now, and uh, seeing all of you here together tonight uh, is very gratifying to me. I don't know, uh, it's very difficult for me to decide whether I have more admiration for people I see sitting right there or people on the panel with me, because I feel that we really uh, have a wonderful group of people out there who have done so much, uh, and of course it's an honor to be in the pres presence of Mary Robinson, and I'll return to uh, the question of human rights uh, in, in closing. I just wanted to, I don't know if this is going to, it is going to work. Uh, it's already been mentioned that 54 years ago, the door to greater involvement of the medical, and by medical, I mean there are people in this room who are scientists, who are doing bench work, who are doing clinical trials, there are people who are clinicians, nurses, uh, social workers, physicians, community health workers. Um, the door was opened many years ago for us to be involved in the human rights struggle around, uh, and, and this is a, a, a fairly uh, recent discovery in a way that we should have been working all along with the human rights community. The medical community and the human rights community are doing, fighting the same struggle. Articles 25 and 29 of the Universal Declaration make it very clear that the fruits of scientific advancement are meant to be shared by all, and this is a central tenet of human rights uh, thinking, I won't say ideology, but thinking, and it should fuel our engagement as a community of activists broadly conceived as we face, uh, as has been noted, the greatest uh, infectious threat to human well-being in recorded history. Now, I have the great privilege of um, uh, talking to you about programs that have already really achieved a certain maturity, and you'll forgive me for using slides, medical school professors do this. In fact, and I, I will thank, by the way, my medical students here today. Why would we want to use antiretrovirals in places where people lack water, lack housing, lack education? And the answer to this has already been uh, advanced, I think, and I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But one reason is because, as Sandy said, as George has said, as Erica said, because they work, because they do something in the body of people living with HIV that alters the course of history, alters the course of their personal history. 
And when we talk about history, this is not just the grand events of our times. And believe me, my grandmothers would be very thrilled to know that I was sitting at a table with Mary Robinson, were they here on the planet. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking about the great events of history. I'm talking about the choices that we have to make on an everyday level. Who, how do we engage with this problem? And individual histories are altered, of course, by access to the fruits uh, of science that we already have before us. And I speak not only about therapy, but about prevention, about what we can do to change the course of the epidemic today. So there are many reasons that we would want to link up with human rights groups and say that access to care, and I don't mean only antiretrovirals, but access to care is a critical human rights issue for our times. Now, because I am with a fairly, uh, not a fairly, I think a very hospital audience, I, just, I do want to point out that the impact of this disease, for those interested in measuring impact, has been profound. This is projected life expectancy, sorry, this is real data. This was just published about a month ago in The Lancet. And you see the impact on life expectancy of, of HIV in these most effective countries. An almost identical curve is seen when you look at the impact on mortality in the United States of antiretrovirals among people living with HIV. So this, in a way, you have two very similar looking curves, one showing the path of death and the other showing the path of life. And so I think that we need to keep this in mind, even without a vaccine, which is what we need, even without more effective chemotherapy, that is, more effective medicines, there's an enormous amount that we can do if we were to put our minds to this war rather than to other wars. Now, I'm not going to go into the conventional wisdom because this also has been discussed. We've been told it's not feasible in resource-poor settings. We've been told that the medications are too expensive. And the, the thing that I think is striking about this year is I think this is a year when those commentaries are meant, instead of st to stop a conversation, to start one. Why are there no infrastructures? Why are the drugs so expensive? For 10, for almost 10 years, again, these have been conversation stoppers, not conversation starters. Now, finally, because of activists, in my view, because of the patients, because of their allies, people making common cause with people living with HIV, we've been able to move the conversation forward to why we don't have these infrastructures and why these medications cost so much. That's the beginning of a conversation that we can have. Now, we have so far in this struggle, these two decades that have been mentioned by Sandy, we have put the burden of proof on the poor. This is a point Eric made as well. We've put the burden on, of proof on those living with HIV. We have to move the burden of proof away from those living with HIV and put it instead on the backs of the policymakers and those who hold power and control resources. That's where we need to move this debate if we're to move forward. Let me just give you an example from the medical literature, which I don't expect all of you to be reading, but here you see, uh, in again, a very influential journal, you see arguments that it's really not a good idea to use to, to push for treatment because it's not cost-effective. This has been become the logic of our times. This is from this summer, all right, this summer, many years after the discovery of at least fairly effective medications that, are, again, can alter the course of history, as has been noted. And here we have ongoing arguments. This, I think, is what George meant when he discussed the petty arguments that have dominated the HIV debate so far. Should we be doing prevention or should we be doing care? When, of course, again, and I, I'm echoing George here, this is not the argument we had when we suddenly had a massive war on terror. Should we do this or do that or do this or do that? We just did everything. Some of it, I would argue, quite troubling. When we move those resources over towards, instead of having weapons of mass destruction, weapons of mass salvation, when we move that kind of energy into stopping this epidemic, we will alter the course of this epidemic, and, and promptly so, in my view. Now, let me just show you some of our own experience from rural Haiti. And I am very grateful, again, that I was invited, invited back. But how could people be so confident about what's cost-effective and what's not when the inputs, to use the word of the economists, is change, are changing so rapidly? In our own experience, Partners in Health, we have seen the prices of drugs drop very dramatically. So how could we say something is cost-effective when we've seen all the parts of the equation changed rapidly in the last two years. Humility is 
warranted and, alas, often lacking in policy circles, except for Sandy, of course. <laughs> now, our, our, our own view is that prevention and treatment work fine together. In fact, I would go so far, and I think other than in the, others in this room would agree, that having a prevention program that does not include treatment in a mature epidemic is probably not effective or smart, probably not going to work. So the people saying, well, we do prevention, they should be looking for people who also provide care, because that's what we need to do. We need to work together to attack this struggle on all different levels at the same time. Otherwise, as has been noted tonight, we're also ignoring 42 million people, which I think is a, a very um, unacceptable uh, a call for us to do. Now, how about in these resource poor settings? Well, this is where I came from. This is a, alas, a common enough dwelling in rural Haiti. This is the setting in which we work. And let's just, let me just go through some of the, we meet people in clinic and they come back from the city. This is in a rural r area of Haiti, in the, in, in the rural reaches of Haiti. And they come back from the city where they have gone because they don't have land in the countryside and they don't have jobs and they come back with HIV. More than half of all of our patients are women, uh, which doesn't surprise those of you working in the third world. And they tell us their stories. And we find out very rapidly that these are not people who have acquired HIV because they don't know how HIV is transmitted. They've acquired HIV because the social conditions in which they live are too precarious to pre prevent them from acquiring HIV. And I think that is what Mary Robinson meant when she talked about these girls pushed into into sexual slavery, into, you can't even call it commercial sex work because they're not even being paid for sex. They're getting food, for, they're, they're after food or tuition to go to school. And again, this is, if this is not uh, enough to make anyone uh, revolt, then I think you know, the human rights community still has not put in its two cents. Now, we have started from the beginning calling our effort the HIV Equity Initiative introducing antiretrovirals to rural Haiti. And I have to say, and people in this room will remember, that this was regarded as a foolish enterprise by some of our friends and, and colleagues. That this was not, again, cost-effective or a smart thing to do. The good thing is that we weren't listening only to people like me, experts. We were also listening to people living in these villages and living with this disease. And they gave us very clear instructions that were quite different from those we got from experts. So we developed our own system which we called, this is a community health worker who, are, who is called in Haiti an accompaniateur, someone who accompanies. Works fine in Spanish too, doesn't sound so good in English. Uh, but this is a patient and his accompaniateur. She is making common cause with him. She's going to his house every day. She lives in the same village with him and she gives him his medication. And as been mentioned already, we also do this in Boston, in Roxbury. And one of the hardest things that's been we've had to face here in Roxbury, and some of my coworkers who do work on this project are here tonight, is we can't get funding to support the community health workers in in Boston, and I, that's absurd. You know, this is a good way to move forward the agenda and do a better job. And the fact that we can't find funding for this is really ridiculous. Now, how effective is it? Well, I'll tell you. I go between a world-class teaching hospital at Harvard and rural Haiti. And I, we have more than twice as many patients in our little clinic in Haiti than we do in our big hospital in Boston. And we have, we're following over 3,000 patients. With, there are two physicians who are dedicated to HIV. The rest of it is all community health workers. So when people say, well, there's no infrastructure, you need to find out, is the person who's saying that interested in starting a conversation or stopping it cold? Because what infrastructure are we talking about? Not labs. We just are now putting together a lab many years after having started treatment. The missing infrastructure was community health workers who could go to the homes of the patients and deliver them the care that, that, that I would add that they wanted to do. The community health workers are, are very pleased to do this. So we're, we're following with a tiny staff of, uh, in terms of physicians and nurses a very large patient population and the missing infrastructure is not what many of you have been led to believe. And what about efficacy? Well, first of all, and I want to reclose because I think Mary Robinson was right to underline the question of stigma. The impact of introducing effective therapy in a, in a rural hospital in Haiti. What is the impact on the nurses and doctors? To say nothing of the impact in the bodies of these patients. Well, morale goes up, hospitalizations go down, and of course most 
eloquently, uh, deaths go away. Of the first 100 patients who we started treating, we're now completing an analysis of these. We're comparing them to two other groups. None of our patients have died, zero. Now, I think, again, this in and of itself should be enough to goad policymakers forward into uh, coming up with more resources to make sure that we can respond to local calls for equity. Let the patients comment themselves, though. That's how I would like to close my comments here, is let the patients who have a hard time getting to the United States, actually, getting visas, for example. Now, what about stigma? Here you see two completely contradictory comments about stigma. And I would argue here uh, um, that they couldn't possibly both be right, not in one place. Either one is, one is right and one is wrong, right? One says stigma prevents us from using H ARVs, and the other says, well, stigma is lessened by H ARVs. And that's the level of discourse we've had so far. It's been very crude. I mean, again, how could this both be right? Let me quote one of my patients. This is Samuel. And, and these patients, by the way, have said, please, use our pictures, our words, and our names, because we don't get invited to conferences like you do. That's a good point. <laughs> so this is Samuel. And he is, this is the day he started on the left, or where the right lung would be if you were a doctor, over there. Um, I get confused about left and right. But he started therapy on that day. And this is about a year and a half later. Both pictures taken, I'm pleased to say, by one of, as they say at Harvard, my medical students. She's here tonight, I think, so I don't ever say to her, you're my medical student. But, uh, and, and I have the great privilege of being able to work with young people who are engaged. And that's one of the most exciting things for me, coming back up here to Boston, is to know how engaged some of the students have been around this. And I think way ahead of us in the expert community. But you can read what the patients have to say. And let me just, a couple more, and then I'll stop. This is Adeline dying in the summer of 1999 in her house and at a, a party the patients had a couple years later. And as she says, what can I say? The medicines are eloquent enough. And, uh, and we get this kind of response consistently. Um, we, as you, has been mentioned, Partners in Health has, has worked with PHR. We have developed, a, I think, what is an interesting and innovative program to push forward the Access to Care Initiative as a human rights initiative. And I would invite you to look on our websites, both of them. This is a patient who came to us dying of HIV, carried in, as, as have been many others. And this is the same patient delivering what was called the Declaration of Conj only eight months later at a Health and Human Rights Conference. <laughs> These patients in Haiti have... Have their, we've translated their words. Uh, look on the websites, www.ph.org. It's connected to the PHR website, and read what they have to say. And my last line is, we clearly have to forge new alliances in order to move this forward, as has been mentioned by everyone. Now, um, again, I'm, not, I'm a good doctor. Catholic boy. Um, but I, last Sunday was World AIDS Day. Is that right? Last Sunday. And I was, I just want to tell you, again, I'm not sure if my, what my grandmothers would say about this. I, I know that Mary Robinson will support me. But I was in a Roman Catholic church in rural Haiti, right under a picture of Our Lady of Je ne sais quoi. And um, <laughs> the priest is moving in and out. There's 1,800 kids in the church, and not counting adults. There were probably about 3,000 people there. And we're sitting there inside you know, St. Michael's Parish, St. Michel, in Boucancare, rural Haiti, talking about condoms, talking about protecting young people, talking about how girls can be protected from being abused. So don't believe for a minute that these alliances are impossible. And we can think of local variations. Um, now, um, I am going to just say in closing that uh, Political will, and I want to pick up on, on Sandy's point here, and I feel obliged to add this as my closing point. My friend Gene Rivers here, he said, I said, oh, Gene, you know, you're into this tough love stuff. He said, yeah, I'm the far right of the religious left, and you're the far left of the religious left. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so I will, I, I take that as a compliment, of course. I will add, uh, out of a sense of obligation, as a, uh, a, someone who was born in this fine state, um, that political will is not enough. The Haitian country coordinating mechanism is led by the First Lady. The president of Haiti 
talks about AIDS and the rights of people living with HIV all the time. He talked about it in the day before yesterday in Cuba. He talked about it in Johannesburg at the meetings that, you know, these meetings that, that people go to when they're heads of state and for which we have to thank Mary Robinson for putting up with for many years. <laughs> but it, I, I have to say that this has, not, um, this has not been enough because what is going on right now, and I, I think every American citizen certainly should know about this and everyone involved in human rights, is the Haitian parliament, and you mentioned the parliament, and the Haitian government have signed a number of agreements with the Inter-American Development Bank, which is the premier development bank of Latin America. And these three loans of interest to me, we never, our group does not accept aid like this, so this is not why I'm bringing this up. The three loans approved are for clean water, for primary education, and for health care reform. And it turns out that, one, that the United States administration has veto power over these loans. And so the most powerful country in the world is right now, using your names if you're Americans, vetoing water, education, and health assistance to the government of Haiti. And I hope that you will agree with me as a physician that this is, makes our work providing services to people living with HIV in Haiti very difficult. I won't say impossible because I don't believe that anything is impossible, but it makes our work very difficult. And I would encourage my colleagues in the human rights community to look more broadly, including looking towards Washington and asking why it is so difficult for people like us at Partisan Health to deliver the care that we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Let's give a round for our entire panel, Mary Robinson, George Monguzzi, Eric Sawyer, Sandy Thurman, and Paul. Thank you so much. Um, I was going to pose a few questions of the whole panel, but we only have 16 minutes left. We're going to end at 9. So uh, those with a question, please stand up. There are two mics in the front. Line up behind. And I see Amira, you're on first. Amira to run from the Carr Center for Human Rights at Harvard. Thank you. Uh, is this on? All right. Hopefully you can hear me in the back. Um, I have a question for Sandy Thurman. Uh, Sandy, you spoke, I think, very correctly about essential, uh, the essential elements of political and resources, finance, to get this done. And your old boss, Bill Clinton, wrote about it a week ago, saying the same things in the New York Times. But let's face some facts here. It was under the Clinton administration that foreign aid levels to the poorest countries reached their lowest point ever, below even the Reagan administration. Bill Clinton gave less foreign aid than Ronald Reagan did to poor countries. And for all the talk that Bill Clinton and others, Paul Farmer especially, have made about the need for AIDS treatment, in all those years of the Clinton administration and when you were directing the White House AIDS policy office, the U.S. government did not send one pill, not one pill of antiretroviral therapy to anybody in the developing world. I don't blame you for, and this is not, but it is the prelude to a question. question. Here is the question. What would you advise your successor in the White House AIDS policy do now? Because I don't regard that record as a success in either resources or leadership. And second of all, might it not be better now as a strategic issue to hold Mr. Clinton accountable for what was grievously poor leadership in this area rather than let him go on and through your organization redeem himself for having done too little? Well, again, I think that, that certainly we didn't do enough. I don't think we did and neither does Bill Clinton. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, when I came to the office, um, our levels of AIDS funding had been flat funded uh, for more than seven years, which was no great record. Um, we had discussions when I went to the office about increasing our aid to um, AIDS programs around the world, and we tripled them in two years, which again was not a lot of money. But getting, you know, it's not just the president who makes decisions about funding, it's the president and the Congress who make decisions about funding. 
So while Bill Clinton certainly needs to accept responsibility for not taking a greater leadership role early on in his administration, and I think he did that. He did it, I don't know if you were in Barcelona, he talked about this, he talked about his regret about needle exchange um, at that time. I think there are certainly in hindsight things he would have done differently. Um, but in the end, we were able to triple our funding. It wasn't enough. The fact of the matter is that you can still count in a bottle the number of pills we're putting people in people's mouths in the developing world um, in this country. So we have a long way to go. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but I do think it's important for people like Bill Clinton to be willing to say that he wished he had done more um, and to step up the, to the plate and advocate openly about the need, particularly for treatment. Because as you know, in the public health hierarchy of this nation, the standard was not to provide treatment, only to do prevention. And there's still quite an argument about that today. So focusing on giving treatment as opposed to investing all of our resources in prevention alone was an enormous battle in the Clinton White House and continues to be a battle in the Bush White House today. So it's quite frankly, the person who had to fight that battle, I can tell you that I got banged like you cannot imagine uh, by my mentors in public health and by my colleagues to not do any care and treatment at all. Um, so the fact that we've come so far in such a short period of time I think is good. I think we ought to give some support to those who are now willing to step up to the plate to admit their error and to move forward. And I think we need to encourage the Bush administration to do the same. Do you, do you have any views, of Sandy, about what the most important thing to do to push the Bush administration further? Well, I think there are a couple of things. I think that, that we have to focus on the kinds of issues that they're comfortable with. I think we're seeing some of that happen now, and that's looking at the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, which a conservative um, administration is comfortable with, looking at adding care and treatment for mothers and expanding that to families. I think we have to take this one step at a time um, and use something that people are comfortable with, this administration is comfortable with, and then back into the treatment mode um, using that argument, and I think we're making some progress. In the front over here. Uh, yes, on International Human Rights Day, I'd like to thank the panelists and the organizers for the compelling program presented, because we all here know as activists for human rights that silence equals death. For the victims of atrocities, there is always the presence of absence. Disappeared victims of tortures, Friends lost to AIDS, the most deadly infectious disease of our time. Because silence equals death, we must not permit the voices of those dehumanized by heinous human rights viola violations of mothers such as myself and our children to be silenced. My son, Nathaniel Valentine Scarantino, now aged two, a victim of heinous acts of torture committed by agents of the United States military, has been disappeared. How many others like him are there? For those responsible for his disappearance, I plead with them to preserve his life, to cease all acts of torture against our American children. I plead with the federal and state authorities to identify the American toddler who has assumed my son's identity and is being used as a human shield pr to protect the groups responsible for committing and concealing heinous acts of torture against our children. Thank we you, must not oh, allow the I nation want to move to on to the next question, if you don't mind, but we would love to have you speak to their people, representatives of many human rights organizations just a, who just would be a happy moment. to Thank you, Susanna. take your I, information. Just a big a moment a for my son's brain. life. And yeah. We must not allow the nation to be a haven for those who would persecute the most vulnerable members of our society. This is a call to arms to, to defend human rights here in our homeland where they are most precious to each of our survivals, to cease the trafficking of American children for the macabre purposes of illicit human subject experiments. Thank you very much. A question over here. Um, yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a clinician also, uh, quite interested in human rights, but I, I feel like on this uh, International Day of Human Rights, I, I have one other kind of question. We've seen what disruption of services um, in this country, for example, closure of police and fire stations in poor areas in the Bronx, have done to the increase in HIV AIDS. And so my grave concern at the moment as a US citizen is what the impending war on Iraq could do 
both to resources here and to uh, the impact of both bringing soldiers and the so-called collateral damage in that country and in other countries. And I'm wondering how uh, one, you, Eric, who gave us such a moving uh, call to action, might suggest that we could oppose what seems such an inexorable event and how other people on the uh, panel think that this discussion even impacts human rights discussions in terms of uh, bringing more resources to other parts of the world. Um, well, I don't know if, if, if I have a, you know, <laughs> the answer to the question, but um, there, are, there is an ever-increasing movement uh, for uh, opposition to the war, and uh, there's, there's actually a vigil that's being courageously led by a number of women in Washington, D.C., in the park uh, right across from the White House called the, the, uh, the Pink Watch, I think it's mm -hmm. called, uh, which is, you know, women opposing uh, the war, um, uh, you know, in, in Iraq. And uh, there's a number of groups that have been organizing both in New York City, I'm, I'm sure probably here in Boston as well, uh, opposition to uh, war and redirecting of scarce resources, especially in this time of economic uh, crisis, uh, to more important uh, issues like health uh, uh, and, and, and other uh, issues that are facing Americans. So um, I'd encourage everybody to, you know, get on the web. It's a, it's a great resource. Uh, connect with an organization that seems to be doing uh, something that's in line with your political beliefs. And don't be silenced because silence equals death is uh, kind of the, it, it was, you know, the, it is the symbol of the ACT UP uh, uh, movement. And uh, if we're silent, uh, you know, the powers that be will, will continue to do all the wrong things. I would just like to add to that that whatever people's views are on the security and war issues, uh, there is enormous amount of resource in this country. And uh, we are a country that has to be able to deal with health and poverty and economic aid in addition to whatever else the priority might be. And uh, that can also be a very powerful argument. All of us have to be willing to communicate to our political leaders, our own representatives, that we are willing to make a sacrifice right, as it, taxpayers it, so not, that it's, people's it's, lives can be saved. Right, it's not either or and which, which piece of the pie gets the funding, you know, make the pie bigger. We can find the money if we want it. Right. Yes, I, thank you. Uh, the panel has, I think, very appropriately focused on issues of human rights. Uh, and some of the speakers have focused on the barriers uh, that prevent access to treatment and care. Um, at the same time that we're here tonight, the U.S. government is engaged in uh, trade negotiations on intellectual property rights, which prevent, which will expand property rights of patent drug holders and reduce access to affordable medicines. I think the clinicians who are here and the treatment activists understand the difference between advocating for access to care when antiretrovirals cost $10,000 a year mm -hmm. and advocating for access to treatment when medicines cost $200 a year from high quality generic producers in India. I guess my question to the panel is, in addition to identifying the lack of funding, isn't it appropriate to also identify the interest of the pharmaceutical interest, uh, industry and the way that the U.S. trade policy is pursuing those interests in current negotiations? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, what the gentleman's talking about is uh, right now the U.S. government and our, our trade rep are negotiating a new treatment with Venezuela, uh, and part of uh, what is happening is there's incredible pressure by the current administration to uh, get the Venezuelan government to um, basically accept in that trade policy uh, more stringent guidelines than are currently in the the GATT Treaty or, or in the, the policies of the WTO, including uh, the TRIPS Agreement, which allow governments in the time of a national uh, crisis to produce generic medicine, regardless of whether that medicine uh, is covered by a patent. And everyone, uh, and, and there's, there's a number of groups like the Consumer Project on Technology, Ralph Nader's group, uh, and, and others that are um, organizing and trying to get uh, constituents to, you know, call their congressional representatives to weigh in uh, on this issue and to encourage our administration not to turn the clock back 10 years uh, and, and do the bidding of the pharmaceutical industry, but to allow uh, 
governments the sovereign right of sovereign states to determine what they need to do to protect the public health of their uh, people, even if it means manufacturing drugs that are covered by patents that uh, are owned by U.S. companies. I urge all of you to go on the websites of HealthGap and healthactionaids.org to uh, look for more information on this fairly complicated but very, very important uh, problem. CPTech.org uh, have... is another. Thank you, cptech.org. Um, we have time, I'm afraid, for only one more question, but the panelists will remain up here. Yes? For people who would like to come up and continue the conversation, I know that there are many, many issues to discuss. Thank you. Um, the word stigma was very prominent in your talk, Mary Robinson. I wondered how you went about battling that. I don't know if legislation necessarily would work alone. I see it as a psychological problem. I know how President Bush feels about psychobabble. I hope you won't feel that it's psychobabble for me to say I think it's a kind of, of scapegoating. I see that as a life raft for all too many people. I wondered if you do also, how, how do you see loosening people's fingers off that life raft? What kind of lifeboat do you picture bringing up beside it to get them into it? I get nowhere with this. I worked in an alcohol clinic um, in the 1960s. I haven't seen stigma go away from alcoholism. I haven't seen it go away from homosexuality. Um, people get beat up for all kinds of, 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 of um, vulnerabilities. So I should stop. And I'm Thank glad you. we're ending on this important question about human rights and stigma yeah. and women's rights. Yeah. I was actually going to say, you know, thank you for bringing us back to a focus stigma. on uh, stigma and discrimination and vulnerability and mm -hmm. denial on a government side. Um, I think that is at the heart of the discussions. I have to say I've been really very moved and privileged to be on this panel. I've, I've learned quite a bit tonight, particularly about the effectiveness um, of the uh, drugs in, in very poor circumstances. We don't hear enough about that. I mean, it's really very good, and it's a message that I'll certainly try to take further because one of the things we want to focus on is access to drugs. But getting back to the dark side, um, it certainly was my experience. A lot of what I was doing as High Commissioner was listening to victims. It was a very small thing, but an important thing. Um, just listening, just letting people tell you how bad it is. And uh, somehow that relieved a little of the pressure of how bad it is. But there is terrible stigma. And it leads to a kind of deadly silence, silence by those who need care but daren't raise their voices. And that's why I echo the message. It's going to need really very determined, um, galvanizing politically and in resource terms and in both prevention and treatment and care terms to address this problem. But above all, we need to be people-centered. If we're really people-centered, we start by understanding that issues of, of stigma and discrimination have to be at the heart of our approach. And I'm really very encouraged by what I've heard from my fellow panel members and from the kind of questions because um, I think it's fundamental to really addressing one of the greatest human rights crises that our world faces this century. We inherited from the last century, but it's not getting better. We haven't really got on top of it. We can get on top of it. I agree very much. But Georgia, it is manageable, and um, we know it can be managed. Um, it's so incredibly important that we have civil society linking and grouping. And I think the links between human rights activists and those with a specialist knowledge in the health area is a really very important advance that we have. And treating um, uh, health issues and issues of HIV AIDS as being human rights issues. Um, then you know that you must combat um, the stigma, the sense of oppression on the individual, it stops the individual from taking steps, even within their family, not telling their family about it. Um, let me just, again, be personal about it. Um, quite early on in my presidency, in order to address stigma in Ireland for those who were gay, who were lesbian in our society, I invited a group come to Aris and Uthron, and for them it was a very important event. But the point was that when you come to the House of the President for a visit, there are photographers there, and half the people there didn't want to be photographed. And that stays with me. Even though they were coming on a special occasion of meeting the President for reasons of 
um, giving them support. Half of them were afraid to be photographed because it would have implications in their family, in their village, in their, and many people left Ireland because of stigma on that issue. So I profoundly understand how much at the root of addressing this problem, the issue of stigma and all the discriminations that come from that is. And I'm just glad that you asked the question that we might remind ourselves that's at the heart of also what we must tackle in combating um, HIV AIDS. And um, uh, I've certainly been further resourced tonight in what I will try to do by this excellent panel that I've been um, privileged to listen to. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I want... We started with a, uh, a quote from JFK, and I want to end with JFK and thank John Shattuck and all of our colleagues here, Tom and others at the library. Um, Bono said in a film this afternoon, God will be our judge. And in the same speech that John quoted earlier, JFK said, history will be the final judge of our deeds. I hope you've all been inspired to take action, join a group, do whatever you can, make your voice heard in Washington, and together with that very strange partnership that we saw on the screen, <laughs> we will prevail. Thank you, and thank you, John, so much. Well, I want to just, before you, uh, if you could just allow us all to recognize uh, the extraordinary uh, way in which our panel and our keynote speaker and our moderator have moved us here tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mary Robinson for this uh, really marvelous way of connecting human rights and this most serious of all human rights issues, uh, the international struggle against AIDS. And I also want to say that she will continue this discussion, I'm told, tomorrow morning uh, at 10 o'clock on The Connection, when you will have a chance to hear more of the human rights AIDS uh, discussion and WBUR, which is one of the sponsors of these forums, uh, uh, will be broadcasting that. Susanna Serkin, thank you so much for your moderating. And Eric Sawyer, George Muanguzi, Sandra Thurman, and Paul Farmer, uh, you all moved us in many ways, and we're all very uh, pleased to have been here in your presence tonight. Thank you all.